Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kendall Trump with Grain Journal Magazine in Decatur, Illinois. Welcome to today's webinar, Facility Design, Maximizing Efficiency and Throughput. This is the 10th in a series of webinars to be presented by Jeets and Grain Journal Magazine in 2019. Today's webinar is sponsored by M&M Specialty Services. M&M specializes in protecting your people and your products with the best in quality and affordability in personal protection products, grain protectants, fumigants, and services. They are based in Leavenworth, Kansas. This webinar is also sponsored by VAA LLC, who has provided engineering and design services in the agribusiness industry since its founding in 1978. Working with owners, equipment vendors, and design-build contractors, the firm specializes in bulk commodity handling facilities, including slip form design, material handling, transportation, and export. They are based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Our presenter today is Dr. Kurt Rosentrader. Dr. Rosentrader is an executive or is executive director and CEO of the Distillers Grains Technology Council and an associate professor at Iowa State University. For almost two decades, he has actively pursued research to improve the use of grains and co-products and has been developing a variety of new applications. You can participate in, in today's Q&A session today by typing your questions into the Ask a Question box at any time during our presentation. We will be addressing your questions during a Q&A session following our presentation. We do have two polling questions for you today. First, how many people are viewing at your location? And second, are you a Jeeps member? Thank you for your participation in these polling questions. As a note, today's webinar is being recorded and it will be posted to our website, graynet.com, within 24 hours. All registrants will also receive an email containing a link to the recording today, the day following the presentation. We will now begin our webinar today. Ladies and gentlemen, here is Dr. Kurt Rosentrader. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you today and share some thoughts with you about facility design. And for those of you that joined me last year for my first uh, webinar, on this topic, uh, welcome back. And for those of you that uh, haven't heard the first webinar, that is still available for you to, to view as well. But uh, today I'd like to continue the discussion about design and engineering topics, and in particular, talk about a couple of things, uh, some in more depth than others. But ultimately, we want to talk about some of the goals for facilities, kind of give you a little bit of an overview uh, pause for a minute and talk a little bit about some historical perspectives because a lot of what we do today really uh, is a function of what has been done generations before. And then dump, or delve into the efficiencies and design and construction and operations and in particular talk about receiving loadout and conveyor systems. So I do have to mention before I, I get too far into the webinar that uh, if I mention any equipment companies or facilities or or the like, uh, these are for example only, and I'm not endorsing uh, one company versus any other company. So let's talk a little bit about facilities in general. So when we talk about facilities, we may be talking about grain facilities, we may be talking about flour mills or feed mills, we might be talking about ethanol plants or biodiesel plants. A lot of what we're going to be discussing today is germane for many of these types of facilities. And so we're not going to be specifically focusing on one facility only. But when we look at facilities around the USA, we look at facilities around the world, there are many existing facilities that are uh, getting up in age and many of these companies are doing retrofits, upgrades, expansions. Uh, but then at the same time, there are new facilities that are also being built uh, each year as well. And so the interesting thing about designing and constructing grain handling facilities, there is a continuing need uh, to keep building new and keep expanding the old. And the grain, the food, the feed, the biofuels industries, there's a continual need for, for this type of activity. And so 
it's important that we understand some of the design concepts and then pass them on to the next generation of designers and engineers. And that's what I try to do here at Iowa State with my students to kind of share uh, what are some best practices, what are some rules of thumb. And so uh, that's what we're going to be talking about today. And unfortunately, a lot of the knowledge that goes into designing and building grain facilities, really, it's, it's anecdotal. It's maybe proprietary. Uh, there's a lot of information that's passed from one generation of designers down to another generation at specific companies, but there are some official standards as well that can serve the industry, and those include the ASABE standards, the ISO standards, uh, and some of the other uh, standards organizations. And ultimately, when we think about facilities, whether you're expanding, whether you're constructing new, uh, ultimately what drives a lot of our business and what we're trying to accomplish is not just to to build and operate new facilities but also to make them more efficient and that is uh, played out in terms of cost reduction in terms of the capital side but also the operational side as well so when we think about facilities whatever type of grain handling or storage facility we're talking about Ultimately, we have to protect the grain until we can process, process that or utilize that grain or oil seed for whatever the intended purpose is. And when we talk about protecting grain, we've got to protect that from weather, from insects, from rodents, birds, mold, but we also have to protect the grain from deterioration, which is going to happen regardless of what we do or don't do. And so when we think about maintaining quality, the grain is going to continue to deteriorate over time and what the best that we can hope for is to slow that rate of deterioration so we're never going to improve the quality of the grain that comes into the facility the only thing we can do with that grain really is slow that rate of deterioration and other goals for facilities when we're talking about the small local facilities we have repositories for grain, and that may be uh, for local use or ultimately shipped out to uh, larger terminals. Uh, we might be talking about flour mills or feed mills or ethanol plants where we're storing the grain temporarily until we can process that into flour or into biofuels. And then at our endpoints, we might be storing grain until we can, can use that. And so there are a variety of facilities that our discussion today really is, is germane to. And when we think about modern facilities, we have to think about automation, we have to think about safety, we have to think about uh, longevity. And when we think about facilities today compared to 100 years ago, many of our facilities, even the smaller scale facilities, have larger capacities, higher throughputs, dust control systems, safety systems, automation controls, and ultimately a lot of the facilities that we see in operation today are much more efficient than uh, the previous generation of facilities. And there are a variety of reasons for that. So if you look at the small scale facilities, such as the farm where I grew up, uh, we thought it was really large. At the time, it seemed to be large capacity grain bins, but anymore, and they're not so large, uh, 15,000 bushels isn't that much. But the discussion we're having, whether we're talking the small facilities or we're talking about some of the more modern facilities that we see on farms, we see the sizes growing, we see the complexity growing, we see a lot more iron going into the ground and concrete going into the ground, larger drying capacities, uh, bucket elevators, a lot more sensors and instrumentation we see uh, on the farm, and this isn't even a commercial facility. But then when we start thinking about the commercial facilities, whether it's steel or concrete, we have a variety of different sizes, shapes, capacities, throughputs. Um, and we can't forget about uh, some years where we have to utilize the extra storage capacity of some of the surrounding area that we just don't have capacity for either in the steel or the concrete. And we also have the scale of facilities that we see down in New Orleans and other port terminals where we are shipping out grains and cereal products overseas. So when you think about designing facilities, 
even though the complexity and the scale uh, varies tremendously, there are a lot of commonalities, whether you're talking about a small farm scale or you're talking about a large port terminal. But uh, regardless, it's important that you select, you size, and you locate your equipment and your buildings uh, logically in order to be uh, successful as an operation. Everything has to work together, and ultimately your facility is only as efficient or only as strong as the weakest link. So when you think about piecing all of the parts of the puzzle together, really you are only as fast as your slowest operation. Uh, or another way to look at it, the you're only going to be producing or resulting in uh, quality at your weakest point. So we want an efficient, we want a cost-effective operation. And whether you're talking about a really small scale farm size system or you're talking about a terminal system or somewhere in between, ultimately, in these days, we're really talking about moving more than 20,000 bushels per hour. And that's even on the farm scale. So when you think about all kinds of facilities, we can break up these facilities into different different ways to look at them but what we're going to talk about today we're going to talk about some primary components we're going to talk about some secondary components and when you have incoming grain outgoing grain the five main components that uh, between this year and last year that we're discussing are the receiving the distribution the storage the reclaim and then the loadout of the grain so all facilities are going to utilize these to some degree at some level of complexity and it's important that when we think about designing and operating grain handling and storage facilities that we do a good job with each of these five things. And these five components really are the areas that drive our design choices as engineers and, and builders. Now, there are a lot of other components. The secondary components, what I'm calling them, cleaning and aeration, drying, dust control, sampling, instrumentation and controls. These are all important also. Uh, they are, and not to diminish them, uh, they're extremely important, but they don't drive the design choices for the most part. Most of the time, design choices are driven by these five, the receiving distribution, storage, reclaim, and loadout. And not all facilities are going to be utilizing the secondary systems to the same degree. For example, some ethanol plants do not have drying systems or aeration systems. Uh, it really depends on the size and, and scope of the facility that you're talking about. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, uh, here's a, an example flow diagram for what I'm calling a large grains elevator, uh, handling grains such as corn, soybeans, the large cereal grains. Uh, all five components are going to be present as we mentioned earlier. So. If you see the, the flow chart there, receiving distribution, storage, reclaim, and loadout, and some of these are going to be tied to others, and there will be feedback loops and the ability to move grain amongst different parts of the operation. And then you see a facility like this, and uh, there you go. So uh, if you think about a small grains elevator uh, that's going to be handling a variety of small grains like oats and rye and barley, and triticale, uh, canola, etc. cetera. Um, the facilities that are designed to handle and store small grains tend to be more complex, have more storage bins, have more cleaning systems. And so we have to recognize that even so, these facilities still use the same five major systems, receiving, distribution, storage, reclaim, and loadout. So when you think about farm scale or you think about commercial scale operations, we've talked about the five major systems, but when you're working with a company, you're working with um, a management staff, uh, you're working internally uh, with your own design team, Ultimately, the choices that you make for design are going to depend on the client's needs and the requirements. And oftentimes also their opinions, what they've noticed that's worked in the past, 
what hasn't worked, what's been challenging. Um, but something I think that's important that we make sure that we build in from the beginning is operational flexibility because oftentimes it's more difficult to make a facility more flexible uh, if it hasn't been designed from the beginning to be flexible. And sometimes owners will consider the possibility for future expansion, uh, sometimes they don't. Uh, that's something that uh, we definitely need to think about if a facility is on a growth curve and there's a potential for expanding the facility in the future. Um, I have to give a shout out to the engineers for their creativity and imagination because uh, oftentimes pulling these systems together gets to be a, a bit of a creative process. Unfortunately, cost drives a lot of the design choices that we make, so we have to be cognizant of cost. I think it's important we, we pause for just a second and we look back at history. If you attended my, my webinar last year or my Jeep's presentation last year, you know I like to talk a little bit about some historical perspectives. So I'm not sure how many of you have ever been to Buffalo, New York to visit the Concrete Central Grain Elevator, but this was one of the very first uh, commercial terminal elevators that was built in the United States. It's no longer in operation, but when we think about facilities that we have these days, uh, this facility really was ahead of its time and uh, built for loading ships. And you'll notice the two large rusty towers are actually uh, uh, loadout uh, spouts, loadout systems that are built on wheels that could move uh, to the various bins up and down the length of the grain elevator. But even before this, the design choices that we make and the way that we design grain handling facilities, really, it goes back to before the Revolutionary War. So if any of you are looking for uh, an interesting read, I would recommend The Young Millwrights and Miller's Guide. So it was first published by Oliver Evans in 1795, shortly after uh, the Revolutionary War. And it was actually uh, built as a, a design guide for flour mills. And you'll notice in terms of the subscribers, and there were about 20 different uh, editions of this that were published throughout Oliver Evans' lifetime. He was a millwright that uh, was hired by the wealthy people in the colonies to build flour mills on their, their farms. Um, so you'll notice the first subscriber was George Washington, President of the United States, Thomas Jefferson, uh, Aaron Burr, John Rutherford. Uh, there were a whole host of uh, the higher ups in the U.S. government. There were also landowners that uh, hired Oliver Evans to design their, their flour mills. But it was an exciting time uh, back uh, after the Revolutionary War because anything was possible. And the fact that Oliver Evans published an engineering design guide, uh, it was uh, really uh, an historical event um, and U.S. historians say this really was a sign that uh, you know the sky was the limit in terms of the birth of the country and but beyond that it's very interesting because uh, what Oliver Evans used was water wheels to power the facility and power bucket elevators screw conveyors uh, to fill bins to run uh, sieves to run chaffers so the idea of a mechanized automated mill system uh, this is the legacy that we are operating from. Uh, this was the, the very first design guide. So the rest of our discussion today, uh, we can blame onto Oliver Evans. So let's talk about design. Let's talk about efficiencies and construction and operation. And some of the things that uh, I think are important that um, the people who do the design work uh, understand. So for those of you that attended my webinar last year, uh, or attended my Jeep's presentation last year. Uh, I spent some time uh, talking about receiving, distribution, storage, reclaim, and loadout systems. And so if you want to um, get a refresher, I would recommend uh, watching the previous webinar. But this year, we're going to spend a little time talking about more specifics uh, from the design side. So in terms of receiving systems, so when the grain comes into the facility, the first thing uh, that's going to happen. It's going to be dumped out of a truck or a wagon, and then it's going to go into some type of a hopper system. So the receiving hoppers, uh, this is really 
one of the first places that we can control the flow of the grain and the efficiency of that flow through the facility. So uh, some facilities like the local grain elevators uh, have very sporadic um, grain flows during most of the year, except at harvest where they have their maximum inflow of grain. Uh, some facilities like terminal facilities have a fairly constant uh, flow of grain through the system, but ultimately uh, you need to understand what is that flow of grain that's coming in, not just on average, but that peak time during the year as well. So it's been common practice for quite some time to have uh, the hoppers uh, be able to store the capacity of a, a single semi, but as the semi trailers have increased uh, in size in recent years, uh, the 1200 bushel capacity may not be big enough. Uh, ultimately, uh, 20,000 bushel per hour capacity to unload uh, these types of hoppers. Um, historically, that used to be uh, on the high end, but now that's getting to be on the low end of uh, throughput for uh, for your material handling. And this is not just for the conveyor that's going to be located underneath the hopper, but also your gates, your spouts, your orifices, where that grain is going to flow. You have to design that uh, so that it can handle whatever the capacity is, whether it's 20,000 or 30,000 bushels per hour. So something I need to point out though, when you look at a hopper, and in this case, we're looking at a frustum of a pyramid. We think about the flow of the grain, the limiting factor for a hopper is going to be the valley angle. It's not gonna be the side slopes of the hopper, it's going to be the valley angle, which is the junction between the two, um, each of the faces. So the valley angle is actually going to be much shallower than the angles of each of the faces on the hopper. And so when we think about how deep do we need that boot pit or how high do we need that bucket elevator for the receiving elevator, um, we need to make sure that we consider the geometry of the hopper. And ultimately we need to think about angle of repose for the grain. And this chart here shows just some ranges typical ranges for various grains, uh, barley, corn, milo, oats, rice, sorghum, soybeans, and wheat. And these are values that have been published and they're available in the literature. But what we don't have a lot of good information on is the effect of moisture content. So this year where we have a, a wet harvest or a few years ago where we had a really dry harvest, that's going to impact the angle of repose of that grain. Now, when you're designing a facility, you have to design it conservatively. So you have to design it for uh, the scenario where the grain will not flow the best. So in other words, the wettest grain. So you'll need the, the steepest uh, angle of repose. Well, we need to use this information to decide how deep do we make this hopper? What angles do we make the the faces of the hopper and ultimately what is that valley angle between the faces. So the valley angle is really what we need to consider uh, and compare that to the angle of repose. So when you are having your technician uh, or you're designing it yourself and you're designing the hopper in some type of a CAD software, you really need to consider, and in this case, um, hopefully you all can see the angle theta that is the the, the uh, valley angle. So if we know the height of the hopper, we know the angle of the faces. In this case, we're denoting the angle of the faces as alpha and beta. Sometimes the face angles are the same and sometimes they're different. Uh, but if we know the height, we know the face angles, we can calculate what is the theta. So the interesting thing about geometry, sometimes it's not easy, sometimes it's complex, but I've given you um, in the center of the slide here, the calculation uh, to de determine theta. And what you're going to notice, the valley angle theta is a function only of the angle of one face and the angle of the adjacent face, the alpha and the beta. The height of the hopper doesn't matter. So the theta is what we need to compare to uh, the angle of repose for the grain. So um, if you don't want to program that into Excel, 
uh, yourself. Uh, there are some online tools that you can use. Uh, here's one that I've found um, is a very handy, very easy thing to use from the bulksolidsflow.com. Uh, they have an online interface where you can uh, calculate angle of repose uh, and valley angles uh, for various hoppers. Now, in this case right here, just to illustrate, uh, looking at this simple hopper, uh, you'll notice uh, one wall face has uh, a face angle of 50 degrees compared to horizontal. The other one, wall B, has a face angle of 50 degrees, which means, of course, the internal angle to vertical is 40 degrees. But if we have two faces, each at 50 degrees, what you're going to notice at the bottom of the slide near the purple arrow, we're going to have a valley angle of 40.1 degrees. So that's significantly lower than, than the face angles. Now, in this case, we've been talking so far about having uh, the face angles at the same, or the face, faces at the same angles all the way around the hopper, but we don't have to. Uh, in this case right here, um, you'll notice wall A has um, an angle with horizontal of 20 degrees and the other uh, wall B has an angle of 50 degrees. If you have a situation like that, where one is really steep and one is really high, the valley angle is going to be 19 degrees. So this is a really handy program to use uh, if you don't want to program it yourself, but you can certainly set up a quick little program in Excel to calculate the, the valley angle theta. Okay, so after we think about the geometry, we then need to think about the capacity of that hopper. So many of the hopper systems that we use in the grain industry are going to be what we call a frustum of a pyramid, where it's essentially a pyramidal shape that has uh, the point cut off at some point. Uh, maybe, like we see in the center diagram, we have just a single type of hopper system, or it might be like we see in the right-hand side, uh, diagram that we maybe have a couple of frustums that are actually stacked uh, with each other. But when we think about the valley angle, we're really trying to make sure that we have the grain, uh, have the ability to flow out and not get hung up in that valley angle. Um, the flip side now is the capacity of that hopper. And if we need a 1200 bushel uh, capacity, now we need to think about not just the angle, but what is the width, what is the height, uh, what is that capacity? So uh, if we see a simple cube, we all remember from uh, geometry in junior high and high school, volume is length times width times height or for a cube. But when we look at a frustum of a cone, it's a little bit different, or a frustum of a pyramid, it's a little bit different because we need to know the, the surface area on the bottom, the surface area on the top, and that's the open space where the grain is going to be flowing. And then we need to know the height. If you have the challenge of having multiple frustums uh, stacked on each other because you have some type of trajectory change, you'll just have to calculate uh, that second frustum volume using the same type of, of geometrical formula. Now, let's move ahead and talk about s some of the common types of receiving systems. Uh, often you'll see facilities that use gravity-based systems, purely gravity. Some are going to be using mechanical, and some will be using a combination of both. Um, and we'll go through a couple examples shortly. Uh, the trade-offs, if you use a gravity hopper only, the hopper is dumping directly into a bucket elevator to elevate it up to the top of the, the, the bin so that you can distribute that. Um, you're either going to have to have a deeper boot pit or you're going to have to have a higher receiving floor so that you can push that grain down into that bucket elevator without too deep a boot pit, but in that case, you're going to need some type of a ramp built uh, up uh, off of the grade level, or you just need to, to install a taller bucket elevator. Now, the flip side, if you have a conveyor directly underneath your hopper that's feeding into your bucket elevator, that's going to allow you to have a shallower pit, uh, but you, there is a potential that there may be some potential carryover, some potential clean-out issues. It might not be as easy uh, to have identity preservation. Uh, depending on how easy it is to clean the conveyor out, there's going to be more maintenance uh, because you have a mechanical conveyor. And potentially, depending on how you operate the machine, 
uh, the potential for more uh, damage to the grain possibly. So in this slide right here, we see on the left side uh, an example of a gravity system where uh, the truck is dumping into the receiving hopper and that hopper dumps directly into a bucket elevator. And as I said, uh, the trade-off is you have to either have a deeper pit or a higher receiving floor. Uh, on the right side, we see the mechanical system where the truck dumps into the hopper, the hopper dumps directly into the conveyor, the conveyor moves the grain directly to the bucket elevator. So a couple of examples. Uh, on the upper right-hand side, we see uh, an example of a facility that's using uh, gravity only where the truck dumps and the receiving floor is out of the ground so that this boot pit doesn't have to be uh, too deep. Um, the bottom pictures on the left side, we see uh, an example of a conveyor uh, mechanical system uh, that's out of the ground. And the right side, we see uh, the hopper and the conveyor underneath, uh, so the underneath in the boot pit. So speaking of boot pits versus bucket elevators, it's always a trade-off. Should you have a deeper boot pit or should you have a higher bucket elevator? Well, it's fairly easy to look at some cost considerations. Uh, just as an example, um, if you have a boot pit that's 10 foot wide, uh, 10 foot long, and if the concrete wall is a foot thick, um, just a crude approximation, if we're paying uh, $3.70 per cubic foot for the concrete, Basically, you'll be paying $163 per foot of depth. If you have um, six inch walls, you're going to have 21 cubic feet of concrete and that will be about $78 per foot of depth. So depending on how thick the walls are, the cost of your concrete, you can do a quick calculation to determine what is the cost per foot of depth. And it's important to think about this if you're considering um, mechanical system or gravity system. Now, on the flip side, not even considering the cost of the bucket elevator, let's just think about the cost of the structural tower itself. Uh, if we look at either I-beams or H-beams, some values that I pulled uh, recently, so uh, $50 per linear foot, and maybe you're paying more or less depending on the size that you're using, but that's for a 12 inch by a, a quarter inch. Uh, if you've got four columns on your tower, uh, if you're paying $50 a foot, basically you're going to be paying uh, $200 per foot of height on your tower at the top. So if you have more than four columns, you'll be paying uh, fractionally more. Uh, and if you're paying more for the steel than $50 a foot, then you'll be paying more. So uh, ultimately, it looks like, at least with some crude approximations, that it is cheaper to think about having a deeper boot put pit than it is to having a taller tower. Now, the caveat is, of course, every location is different. Concrete supply, concrete cost, steel cost, and also a water table and other geography effects that we have to think about. So, but these are the things that you need to think about. It's not always clear cut that the boot pit is always the better option if you're trying to design your, your receiving system. Okay, loadout systems, we'll talk about that for a couple of minutes. So ultimately we're trying to get the grain out of the facility and ship it uh, to uh, some type of a destination. And depending on what the facility is, sometimes it's trucks, sometimes it's cars. And the discussion right now, we're going to focus primarily on commercial facilities, not really farm scale facilities. Uh, many facilities use uh, reclaim and loadout rate of 50 to 60,000 bushel per hour or more. And especially the terminal facilities that are loading trains, if you're trying to load a unit train in less than 15 hours, it's really important that you have not just the high capacity for the equipment, but also uh, you have the ability to, to, um, to move that grain. So some common ways that we think about this uh, either using overhead surge bins with support structures versus a mechanical fill. Uh, each of these systems can be a bottleneck. Uh, when we're loading trains or loading trucks, if we're using bulk scales, um, we're always using spouting. So when we think about some common systems, uh, the system on the left, a purely mechanical system, we have um, 
a bucket elevator that's dumping directly into a bulk layer and that is feeding into our uh, sampler and then ultimately into the rail car or the truck. The middle diagram shows an example of an overhead surge bin that's built into the facility, whether it's concrete or steel, that's going to feed the bulk weigher, and then the bulk weigher is going to dump into uh, the spout, which has a sampler, and then down into the rail car. Um, and then on the right side, we have kind of a combination where we have some gravity, we have some uh, mechanical conveyance. Uh, they all have pros and cons. So a few examples here, uh, pictures in the top left hand are from the gravity only that has a built-in uh, surge bin. The one on the right is purely mechanical and then the one on the bottom is purely mechanical. So just to kind of food for thought for a few minutes, if we have a bulk weigher that will be um, rated capacity of 80,000 bushels per hour, and this is just a, an example of uh, several uh, commercial bulk weighers that are available. So the scale hopper itself, 788 bushels, the upper garner that's built in uh, 1125 bushels, which is 143% the capacity of the scale hopper. And you're going to want to have more capacity in the upper garner so that you never run short within the scale. And then the lower garner is going to be 964 bushels, 122%. It doesn't need to be as big, but once again, you don't want to have a bottleneck happen there. If you have something happen with the, the rail car, you don't get it progressed uh, in time or, or something. So uh, when we think about systems, just to kind of give you an example. So here's an example of a facility that has a 60,000 bushel per hour rated loadout uh, this one is using a uh, mechanical system that's filling the bulk wear. You see that sitting above uh, the unit train. Uh, this facility here has a built-in upper garner, uh, 14,000 bushel garner that's built into the facility, tucked away in behind the bucket elevator on the facility. So basically 14 minutes it takes to empty that garner. So... Um, Many companies are thinking, well, how do we maximize the ability to get the grain through the bulk weigher? And cycle time within the bulk weigher, yes, that's important. But really what the pinch point is for loadout is to make sure that you have grain flowing directly into that scale hopper. So in this case right here, we need to make sure that we can continually feed that, that upper garner. In this case right here, where you have a built-in surge bin above the bulk weigher, you need to make sure you can replenish that at a correct rate. So because the upper garner is often the pinch point, here's an example of a facility that's using an annex. You'll see the, on the right side, it's using the actual uh, upper portion of an annex silo to serve as a, an upper garner and then a spout that connects uh, directly to the bulk weigher. I've kind of shown this in dashed lines. So uh, in this case, the facility has 172,000 bushel capacity in that upper garner um, in the annex. And this bulk weigher is rated at 60,000 bushels per hour. So it will take approximately 2.9 hours to uh, deplete the grain that's in the, the annex garner. You're still going to have to lift grain with bucket elevator. You're, if you're talking a unit train, uh, you're still going to have to lift 726,000 bushels. And if you have 12.5 hours, it's going to take you 60,000. You're going to need a 60,000 bushel per hour conveyor. What size bucket elevator do you need? You can run some calculations. And if you have a 20,000, 40, 50, 55, or 60,000 bushel per hour conveyor, 12 and a half hours, you really need uh, a, a 60,000 bushel per hour conveyor is going to be a little bit oversized, but um, you're still going to have to lift a lot of grain. And so here's an example of a facility that has two upper garners uh, built into the concrete. Uh, ultimately, 320,000 bushels of upper garner capacity um, at 60,000 bushel per hour loadout capacity, 5.3 hours, both of the garners are going to be emptied. So that means they're still going to have to lift 580,000 bushels. 
And in this case right here, you'll see, depending on the size of the conveyor, if they install a 60,000 bushel per hour conveyor, 9.7 hours will get them the 580,000 bushels. But ultimately, we've got 9.7 hours plus uh, 5.3 hours. So we're at the 16 hour mark right there. So the garners are one of the biggest pinch points in terms of loading a train. And that's something that the designers really need to, to pay attention to. Well, let's shift shift our gears a little bit and let's talk about conveyors for a few minutes. So uh, specifically, I want to talk about bucket elevators, drag conveyors, and belt conveyors. Uh, some of the most common types of conveyors we're going to be, be working with in these facilities. So for engineers and designers, the two key things that we need to worry about, the capacity or the throughput, and then the power required. Ultimately, how much grain can we move and how big a motor are we going to need on the, uh, the head of those conveyors? So when we look at bucket elevator calculations, so uh, all three of these conveyors have been used uh, for several generations. So uh, the theory is fairly well known, but the capacity of a bucket elevator really depends on the capacity of each of the cups that you're using, the fill for each cup, the spacing of the cups on the belt, uh, not just across the width, but also uh, the length of the belt, what's the speed of the belt, and then uh, you have to do some unit conversions, but it's a fairly straightforward calculation. You're going to be calculating uh, bushels per hour. Now, here's where it starts to get a little bit tricky because power calculations, really what we're trying to deal with is overcoming the potential energy, uh, the weight of that grain moving it up the, the height of the bucket elevator. So the power that we are needing to provide to the shaft, uh, the size of the motor that we need, uh, it's going to depend on the capacity that we just calculated. It's going to depend on the test weight of the grain. And you'll notice the capacity didn't depend on the test weight, but the power does. Um, what's the vertical distance between the head shaft and the tail shaft of the bucket elevator? Uh, we've got uh, generally to consider some service factors. Uh, oftentimes we use a uh, service factor of 1.1, which gives us an additional 10% um, in case the, the bucket elevator plugs. Um, we have some conversion factors we have to worry about. And then we also have to consider the efficiency of the speed reducer. And depending on where you purchase your, your reducer, uh, it could vary anywhere from 75% to 95%. Um, but ultimately what we need to do is provide more, the motor needs to provide more power to the speed reducer because we're going to have frictional losses. Now, we could break this up into potential energy versus friction because we'll be having to deal with bearings, uh, pulleys, uh, the belt moving, etc. cetera. Um, essentially, it's the same calculation, uh, but that's ultimately what we're trying to, to overcome is friction as well as the, the force of gravity. Um, there are some simplified ways to, to approach this. So um, some common ways in the industry that we estimate uh, motor sizes. If we know the capacity uh, in bushels per hour that we've previously calculated, uh, we know what's the total vertical distance between head shaft and tail shaft, and then add an additional five feet or 10 feet. Uh, that's sort of the fudge factor. Um, and then multiply it by um, a unit conversion factor. This is going to get you pretty close to what the previous calculation will get you. Let's talk a little bit about drag conveyors. So drag conveyors, uh, fairly simple calculation in terms of volumetric capacity. What is the chain speed? What is the height of the grain mass? And depending on whether it's an on -loss conveyor or a paddle drag conveyor, uh, is the grain going to be sitting above the paddles or not? The height is the height of the grain. It's not necessarily the height of the paddles. Um, what's the width of the conveyor and then a unit conversion factor. Now, it gets a little more complicated when you try to uh, calculate the power requirements because there are a lot of things that we have to worry about. Uh, we have to worry about the length of the conveyor from head shaft to tail shaft, the weight of the chain, uh, and the flighting per length of conveyor. 
Uh, what's the friction between the chain and the flights and the conveyor floor? What's the slope of the conveyor relative to the horizontal? What's the weight of the grain per unit length of conveyor? Uh, coefficient of kinetic friction, uh, the height of the grain mass we've talked about before, linear chain speed, and then some conversion factors. So uh, the challenging part is the friction factors. And there's not a lot of information available um, for most engineers and designers to use. Uh, some of the companies that manufacture conveyors do have this information, uh, but if they don't, then we need a, a better approach or we need a simpler approach. And so what we often do in industry if we know what our volumetric capacity is, we know what the length from head shaft to tail shaft is. Um, this equation is specific for soybeans. We divide by 56,000 and then our speed reducer. So not appropriate for corn or wheat or other cereal grains. Uh, if you're working with corn or other cereal grains, this equation with capacity, the length, uh, the speed reducer, and then divide by 75,000. These are gonna get you pretty close. They're not going to be exactly as accurate as the theoretical, but they're going to get you really close. So that's why we see these commonly used for both soybeans as well as corn. Um, if your dry conveyor is at an angle, if it's not running horizontally, then uh, you have to add an additional uh, power factor uh, to account for the height change. And that is uh, divided by 30,000. Belt conveyors. Um, if you look at this type of uh, scenario, what we really have to do is consider the trapezoidal area, but also then uh, the surcharge at the top because the grain isn't going to be sitting at an angle of repose. It's going to dynamically slide down and slump down to the surcharge. So when we're thinking about capacity and power, uh, there's some ways that we can, can address this. Uh, capacity is easy. What is the belt speed? What is that cross-sectional area? and then uh, conversion factor. And so um, there's been a lot of information published over the years in terms of surcharges, uh, depending on what kind of grain it is, the moisture content of the grain, what is the angle of that surcharge. The belt conveyor manufacturers do a really good job of providing information for their cross sections, uh, not just the slump at the top, but also the trapezoidal area underneath so that you really can get a good understanding of what is the cross-sectional area if you are moving corn at 15% moisture content or corn at 25% moisture content, for example. Unfortunately, it gets more complicated when we're trying to estimate the motor size uh, because what we're trying to understand is what is the effective belt tension? Uh, what is the velocity of or the belt speed? Uh, what is the speed reduction and then some unit conversions? And so um, the belt is going to behave differently in the winter than it is in the summer. A new belt is going to behave differently than a belt that's been uh, used for quite some time because of stretching effects. So um, temperature correction factors, frictional resistance factors, there are a lot of things that we need to worry about if we're going to try to, to understand what is that effective belt tension. And that's also why the systems are built with uh, tensioner systems. Um, and it's been a great, uh, great for the industry that we have automated systems that uh, will tension belts nowadays versus the older style manual systems. But uh, we can overcome this. Um, we can make some approximations that are going to get us quite close. But remember, we're trying to estimate tension. Uh, we need to know belt speed, speed reduction, and then uh, the unit conversion. So belt tension, uh, there are some empirical formulas that um, we can use, and in this case right here, uh, we see we need to worry about the length of the belt, uh, the weight of the grain uh, per length of belt, which we can easily calculate, the weight of the belt per unit length of conveyor, which the manufacturer can provide. Um, is there a height change from head shaft to tail, or tail shaft to head shaft? Um, so the weight of the grain per unit length, the weight of the belt per unit length, uh, these are some things that uh, we can either calculate ourselves or the manufacturer can help us with. And that is a, a simplified way to, to calculate that. That eliminates all of the, the need to measure kinetic and uh, frictional coefficients and thermal um, coefficients. And what you'll see, uh, the empirical 0 0.00068 and 0 0.05 and 0.58, those are uh, some rules of thumb that seem to really work very well. And 
as we get closer to the end, I want to share a few thoughts and then open it up for some questions. So um, a few thoughts. And these are just some some of uh, my random thoughts that I've had over the years. Uh, I think it's really important if you are a facility owner or you're a design builder uh, or some other type of contractor, make sure that everyone on the team reads the blueprints correctly. Um, this is the vendors, this is the field staff, any of your subcontractors. It's easy to get in a rush. And I know that oftentimes uh, when a facility is either doing a retrofit or a new build, uh, workers can tend to rush and then potentially have some safety issues. Well, even if you don't have safety issues, you can still have some construction issues. And uh, just a couple of examples. Um, here's an example. The top graph here or the top image here shows uh, what was actually designed for the top of uh, rail. Uh, this was uh, rail loadout, but also uh, receiving underneath. Uh, you'll see the dark blue line. That's the top of the rail. Um, unfortunately, um, it's a common story where the rail um, contractor doesn't quite read the blueprints correctly. And instead of uh, putting the top of the grade uh, where it should be, perhaps the top of the rail where it should be, um, oftentimes we see some issues happen. And in this case right here, um, the rail contractor uh, installed uh, the top of the grade uh, six inches too high. So is that really a, a big deal? We were able to, you'll see, uh, form some additional concrete um, and then put the, the rails on top of the concrete. Um, was that really a big an issue? Well, um, if you're designing a system like this where you have an internal garner, uh, internal bulk wire, and you have all of the spouts and the samplers and everything set up, uh, so that you can meet the rail clearances and you can still uh, hit the rail system itself, um, it can be a very big issue. And in this case right here, six inches made a, a really big difference because remember earlier today I was talking about cost is always a factor. Well, when you have to change the system, not only are you uh, going to be incurring design costs, but you're also potentially going to have to have structural uh, changes as well. And so if you have to cut concrete or you have to change uh, the location of spouts, you have to change the angle of spouts, uh, the costs start to add up. Um, another example, uh, making sure your field crew reads the blueprints correctly. Um, in this case right here, here's an example of a receiving system uh, where you see the cutout through the concrete floor feeding a spout down into a conveyor. Well, the field personnel didn't quite read the blueprints correctly, and they actually installed the inserts when they were pouring the concrete uh, where the purple is shown. And so uh, the choice was then either build a transition down to the conveyor that's going to be much shallower than the angle of repose or to cut the concrete. And uh, renting a concrete saw to cut through three foot deep concrete is not a cheap proposition. So just a few random thoughts that I thought I would share with you uh, as we talk about uh, designing and building facilities. Um, and also bear in mind that design and construction is a, a dynamic process and it's an iterative process. And uh, there are a lot of different moving parts. So uh, of course, the first place you begin are, what is the client need? What is the client wanting? What are they requesting? But then you have to consider the building codes and standards. I mean, that's always where you start. Uh, you have to build a flow diagram for the system. And then you have to start thinking about not just the layout, but uh, the bin layout, the equipment layout, the facility layout, uh, the capacities of the bins. Uh, and then you can get into your more uh, in-depth process design in terms of capacities, power requirements, uh, motor sizes, etc. And we can't forget about the structural engineers because the process engineers and structural engineers have to have to communicate uh, at all times in order to get a design and a an a facility that's going to meet the client's needs. So um, hopefully uh, this has been uh, worth um, the last 60 minutes of your time. Uh, 
I wanted to share some thoughts with you that I think are important that um, anyone who's thinking about uh, designing or uh, building uh, either a retrofit or a new facility, these are things that uh, really have to be considered because it's not as easy as just putting Lego blocks together. I know my son likes to build lots of things out of Legos. Um, and in some respects, you know, building a facility like this is it's an interesting proposition. But uh, every facility is unique. There are lots of different styles and layouts, uh, but ultimately the five main systems uh, that we've talked about, uh, every facility is going to share the, that commonality. And so we can achieve client preferences, but we have to kind of understand some of the nuances that are going to impact uh, our design. So hopefully some of these thoughts are useful to you. Um, I'm happy to answer questions right now. I'm happy to answer questions offline, and uh, I'm also happy to uh, to talk to anybody in person if you'd like to talk in more depth. So, Kendall, with that, I will turn it over to you to start um, the question and answer time. Thank you so much for a great presentation today, Kurt. This concludes the presentation portion of today's event. We will now begin our Q&A session. If you have not yet submitted your questions, please do so at this time. Okay, Kurt, our first question. What have you found to be the most cost-effective storage solution for 2 million bushel and greater for a new facility? And what are some things that builders can do to make flat storage more appealing? That's a tricky question, Kendall. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's really interesting. Um, if you look at, let's just use the ethanol industry as a good example. Um, many of the larger facilities, 120 million gallon a year, or larger facilities that came up in the mid 2000s and onward, uh, they started with concrete. They realized that they didn't have enough capacity, so then they built steel. Um, and it, depending on the size and depending on the the manufacturer, you know, is the steel half the cost of the concrete, or is is that ratio of uh, narrower or wider. Um, what what I've seen really in, in conversations with a lot of facility owners uh, in the last couple of years, you know, we've seen a lot of these uh, bunker ground systems with tarps. Uh, and I've heard claims that um, these systems, especially the large scale million, two million bushels, you know, half the cost of steel or even less, depending on the manufacturer. So um, there are challenges with uh, storage piles. Uh, obviously, there are a lot of challenges, but a lot of companies are very successful with that um, approach to, to storage. Um, and that's even storage into the late summer months, too. So um, I, I hate to say that, but, you know, the, the, the systems, the, the TARP systems, I think the, the companies have really figured out how to make them work, especially for large scale uh, storage. And what was the second part of the question? What are some things that builders could do to make flat storage more appealing? Ah, uh, so uh, flat storage. Um, you know, some of the challenges uh, that I've heard from various owners, you know, obviously, um, whether the flat storage is on concrete or on uh, dirt, uh, you know, there's a potential for contamination from that side. Um, the ability to load out that grain is getting better because some of the um, some of the, the mechanical conveyance systems or pneumatic conveyance systems, some of the companies have redesigned the way they approach that, and so those are getting better. But I know that uh, getting that grain out of the flat storage or out of the pile into the facility where you can actually then load a train, uh, the conveyance has been a challenge. Um, but also quality control. And what I mean by that is um, whether it's insect control or rodent control or bird control um, or just the deterioration, because even if you put dry grain into a large flat storage building, uh, you're, the aeration systems, you're never going to be able to aerate all of that grain. And so some of the grain you're going to be able to maintain at a very high quality because you can aerate it. And some of that grain uh, is not going to see any airflow at all. And so I think we really need to think about aeration systems um, and maintaining quality. So I think those are those are two things that, that I see as challenges in terms of conveying the grain 
out of the flat storage into the facility so you can load it out um, and then uh, aeration and, and maintaining quality. I think those are, are two big issues that we as an industry still need to, to do better about. Okay, our next question. What do you think the maximum truck unload capacity is with a 1,000 bushel pit? And how many trucks, hop, and hopper drums can you get across the pit in one hour? Oh, my goodness. I think I'm going to have to answer that one offline. I did talk about that last year, um, both at my Jeeves conference as well as my, my webinar. Um, you know, it, it really depends. Um, it depends on the capacity of the hopper. It depends on on the capacity of the truck. Um, I know a lot of companies have been doing timing studies and things. You know, can you do it in, in four minutes per truck? Can you do it three minutes per truck? Um, also, where is uh, the scale located? And, you know, you read stories in Grain Journal about uh, companies that are really pushing the limit in terms of you know, really reducing that time. Uh, less than three minutes. I think I've heard uh, some that are approaching two minutes. So um, there are some facilities that are really uh, pushing that envelope, and that's really impressive. And vice versa. Uh, there are some facilities that are really pushing the envelope on train loadouts as well. And you know, we talked today about uh, the Garner capacities, but, you know, the control systems, the proportioning systems for, for the rail cars, I mean, it all has to work together. Uh, but there have been some really interesting advances the last couple of years. So that 15-hour benchmark um, for some of these facilities, uh, that's not a problem at all. We can do it in less than 10. So um, I think we're really seeing some interesting changes happening. But if if this uh, if the person who's asking this question wants to talk to me in more depth, I'd be happy to do it offline. Sure, I will be sure to send over that information following the webinar. Okay, that is all the time that we have for our questions today. If your question was not answered, it will be sent forward to our presenter. This concludes the presentation today. I want to thank our sponsors, M&M Specialty Services and BAA LLC, for their support in bringing you today's webinar. And I also want to thank Jeeps and our presenter, Dr. Kurt Rosentrader, for joining us today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And Jeeps provides the best networking, education, and professional development for all levels of experience in the industry. So where can Jeeps help you? To start, they can enhance education through online training, local meetings, and events. They can help expand your network of colleagues, industry leaders, and create new friendships. And they can help meet people that can help you. It connects you with 26 chapters across North America. Industry leaders and experts are only a call or a click away. Learn more about what Jeeps can do for you by visiting jeeps.com slash membership. As a reminder, this webinar has been recorded, and it will be available for viewing on graynet.com within 24 hours. All registrants will also receive an email containing a link to this webinar recording. I want to thank you all for attending, and I wish you all 